Well, hello, boys and girls. It's when we feel like it o'clock. And uh, this is Anthony Shiradelli. I have been reading this uh, fellow for, for a short time now, actually. I've been reading a whole bunch of people because we've been doing a lot of hockey writer stuff, haven't we? And uh, I, don't know, I, just, I just love his stuff. Uh, he uh, also is a writer primarily for the Anaheim Ducks, which we haven't did in quite a while. I haven't delved into. And uh, I've loved this organization. I talk about them quite a bit, about how much I think they don't get enough cred for what they've done for the last 15 years for the sport, for themselves, and in general, really. So uh, we're going to go at her today. We're going to talk about some NHL draft stuff. We're going to talk about the future of this organization, uh, what, what, what's the state of the Anaheim Ducks at this moment, and probably a whole bunch of other frolic. So, uh, Anthony, what do you got going on in your life right now, buddy? Oh, thanks, Perlo, for the for the introduction. Uh, much appreciated. I, I'm glad you uh, like my writing. It's it's always uh, it's encouraging to hear that. Uh, right now, I'm currently uh, just weathering the coronavirus storm here in Los Angeles County. Uh, we're a a hot spot, so um, trying to to think as much ducks hockey and and positivity as possible, and uh, analyzing kind of who the ducks are are probably going to go after and this draft whenever it happens after they, after they kind of fell a little bit one spot in the, in the draft lottery. Uh, I know ducks fans are disappointed about that, but it'll give us some good fodder to talk about. Uh, yeah, but just kind of staying safe and, and looking forward to hockey to, for hockey to come back and then for the ducks to come back whenever that may be. Um, so yeah, this is you, you do write for the hockey writers as well. And, uh, so check that out. And he also, he also has a tweet at Delhi tweets, right? Yep, at Delhi Tweets. That's D E L L I T W E E T S, and uh, that's where you'll see a lot of my uh, my hockey thoughts that don't go to, into my articles and, and the occasional uh, non hockey related tweet. Um, so yeah, definitely you can check me out there as well. Yeah, and if you haven't already, which I don't know why everybody in the land has, but you can also subscribe to this too. I mean, hit the like button. There's <laughs> lots of people that have tried it. You try it. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Okay, let's get into Anaheim. And uh, of course, we'll start off with the big news about the draft lottery. And uh, I, I I have to say, I was kind of rooting for Anaheim to move up a little bit here. There would be a great spot for them to pick up uh, something they dearly need right now, but they did fall down. What uh what are, what are we what are your thoughts on who they may pick in that area and maybe is it, do you think there might be any possibility they could try to move up or could they move up? I I th I think it's it's an interesting thought. Um, first of all, a lot of Ducks fans I know were disappointed that they didn't go get within the top three. Uh, that would have been certainly a, a dream situation for for any franchise. But needing a scorer as badly as they do, getting Lafreniere would have been a, a blessing, or Byfield or Stutzel. Uh, all three of those guys, um, but they uh, once again their luck really didn't <laughs> didn't didn't happen. So at the sixth spot, uh, I think I, I've got my eye on two players, depending on if they're available. The Ducks need both a, a scorer, a shooter, sniper type, just a, a purebred goal scorer that'll really help their uh, their really pathetic offensive numbers that have been going on for the past two seasons. Uh, in that case, I'm looking at Alexander Holtz. Uh, he and uh, another popular name amongst Ducks fans is Lucas Raymond, but I, I just like Holtz better. I think Holtz is more the type of player they need right now, a guy who's got a shot on the power play. He's known for his shot. He's got offensive touch. He's bigger. Um, he seems like the type of guy to me that uh, that the Ducks could really use, and, and it's kind of an interesting thing. The Ducks, <laughs> they have good passers. They have guys that it's almost if they had an outlet to get pucks into the net, they, they have some guys who can make plays. Silverberg and Raquel mm -hmm. are particularly dynamic and, and versatile when it comes to passing and, and kind of their vision on the ice. They just don't have anyone that can convert, convert chances into goals. And I think Holtz is that guy. Uh, if Lucas Raymond or excuse me, if uh, Jamie Drysdale, a defender, right shot defender is still available. I know we were talking about the show the ducks might go with him as well because right right shot defense is another huge need for the ducks they, they went after uh, a couple guys in free agency last year that they failed to get in um shattenkirk and uh and i forget oh uh falk who is now uh with with st louis i believe Good thing so they missed out on falk. yeah <laughs> uh, you're right 
but they th- it is a need that they that they uh, certainly could uh, could fill if if um, Drysdale's available. So th- those are the two guys that I'm thinking they they should definitely take a hard look at. How about you? I like both of them. I mean, yeah, I, I see what you mean about Halts. And they a shoot first guy, I think, is what we're trying to say here. They don't really have a shoot first guy. Um, good on Henrique for trying to accomplish that. I mean, if it, if there was a first sh- 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 shot first guy there, I mean, he's he's not – he scored 26 goals. He's not a guy that's normally going to do that. But that's what I love about Henrique. He's kind of a guy that will be whatever you need him to be. Um, ultimately, I think he'd be best as your third line or second line center, uh, playing a lot, playing good defense, but you ask him to shoot, he'll shoot. And he did, and he did it pretty well. Um, but I agree with you. I don't think that's the guy you want to be rolling with as your first shirt as your <laughs> shooter going forward. And Alexander Holtz would be perfect for that. There's a lot of, uh, um, one good thing I've heard is Detroit is heavy for Cole Perfetti. And with that being the case, there's a, that, I think that makes a lot more of a chance that Alexander Holtz will be there at that time. As far as Drysdale is concerned, I'd be, if he comes down to the sixth spot, I think it's regard, regardless of what you're trying to fill. This kid is just like, he reminds me of Makar, which is almost at the same age, but he has that kind of level of talent. McKenzie, Bob McKenzie, his scouting staff, compared him to uh, young Zuboff. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and I see what they mean. Like, the guy holds on to the puck, like, at a level that I, I haven't seen in quite a long time. Zuboff would be a perfect example of that. One of the best guys to hold on the puck in the defensive zone that I have ever seen. So I don't know if he'll reach that, but he's got that kind of a style. Drysdale would be great. What about, I, I think I know your answer, um, a guy like Marco Rossi, uh, I mean, you got to love his talent, but it's it's he's, he's just not that shoot first guy you're looking for, I guess, eh? No, yeah, I don't think so. He, he certainly racked up the points in Major Junior, uh, but it, um, he just I don't know, but and it, it might be an old bias that I that I hold on to that um, isn't necessarily true in the NHL anymore. But he's not huge. Uh, I you don't have to be huge as a forward, but he he those smaller guys. I think we're still on wait and see mode with them. I know everyone's going to point to uh, my having a brain fart right now uh, in Chicago. Um, Don't uh, it. Yeah, Alex to bring it, and uh, and then we're waiting on Cole Caulfield to see how he develops. Uh, certainly, point. John. Yeah, Braden Point, Johnny Johnny Goudreau. None of those guys are particularly big, but we're still kind of within the first wave of those young, talented forwards, and and the NHL kind of changing its mindset. And, and I'll admit I, I'm the same way. Um, uh, Rossi's size it might be dumb of me, but <laughs> turns me off a little bit, especially in the Western conference where you, you still have a bigger, more physical style of play than in the Eastern conference. Um, but I, I'll probably be proven wrong in that sense. We'll, we'll see. Uh, um, but I, another guy and, and, and kind of rounding things out in this topic, uh, Lucas Raymond, I, I had a little bit of a back and forth with uh, one of my fellow hockey writers, uh, Ducks coverage guys, Eddie Jones. He, he likes Raymond a lot. Um, my personal view is that I, I think they have a lot of guys like Raymond already. He, all, uh, You were talking about, uh, again, before we, we started this conversation, recording it, the safe picks that, that Bob Murray has made in the past. I think Raymond would qualify more as a safe pick. He's he's kind of people rave about his talent and he's he's but he's a playmaker and, and kind of can he's the guy who scouts describe as like a he can make a, a great pass as often as he can shoot but like to me that guy is going to pass more than he's just naturally going to pass more than he shoots and um i think we've seen with guys like ricard raquel I, 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 to be honest if, if lucas raymond turns out like ricard raquel it would be a disappointment um not, yes. not to so uh, if you're flirting with a guy, I'd much rather have a guy like Holtz who people think might end up. I mean, Ovechkin and Stamkos is probably too is probably too far out there. But he, if he's the same type of player and he can consistently get you 30 goals, I mean, that's a success. The Ducks need someone who can get 30 plus goals, and he, he's not going to he not score 50 routinely like Stamkos and Ovechkin do. He probably won't. But that style of player, that shoot first, the the trigger man on the power play. Uh, that guy is the guy I want for the Ducks if they're not going to pick a defenseman like Drysdale. My comparison for Holtz was uh, uh, Kessel, actually. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Perfect. 
Yeah, and that would be exactly what they need. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, when you look at this lineup, like I really looked into Anaheim a little closer today, got into all their prospects and stuff like that, which I always peel through. But when you decide to just delve into it a little bit, it starts to come out at you a little more. And, uh, yeah, it, it, is, it is concerning that you don't see anybody in their prospect pool or anything that looks like they can be a 30, 40 goal scorer on a regular basis. And that is so important to have in this. And I, I, I had Lucas Raymond as his like top end being a guy like Marner. Um, that would be top end. I'm not saying he's going to be a Marner, -ish, but he's got a Marner-ish type style, which is exactly what you're saying. Like Marner's a pretty much more of a pass first guy than he is a shooter guy. And, uh, when you don't have anybody past to, as we just described, that they really don't, except for Enrique. But uh, that could that can definitely propose a problem. So I have to be with you on that one, and I I'm pretty sure Holtz will be there at that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, sorry. it's in, it's interesting to map out kind of. I mean, I'm not an expert on every NHL team that's in the top of the draft, but kind of like planning it out, seeing seeing what teams need what type of player. Uh, it, it, you could see maybe Drysdale falling there. I mean, Ottawa has two picks in the top uh, before the Ducks, and um, but they do have Shabbat and a, a couple other young, good defenders. I don't know if they necessarily need Drysdale. Uh, they do have two picks, though, so maybe they, they, they take him with one. And obviously the first couple picks are going to be, the first two to three are going to be Lafreniere, Byfield, Stutzel, in, maybe not in that order, but... Uh, so you kind of, you, you narrow it down to kind of three guys or th basically two teams with three picks to get to the ducks. And, uh, I could see Drysdale maybe being around. I think that would be the best, uh, an excellent scenario. But if Holtz is there, I mean, it would be tough for me to decide between Holtz and Drysdale. Yeah, it would be a difficult decision on that one for sure, because you're going on what you need. I think as a player, Drysdale would probably may may have the higher upside is in his in his uh, uh, position. But uh, I, you're, it's possible Ottawa, I, I've heard Ottawa is really big on Lucas Raymond, like mm -hmm. really, really big. Um, I doubt very much they're going to take him with a third pick. So Detroit, again, if Detroit goes by what I've heard, and I've heard all over the place, they're massive on Cole Perfetti because he lives in the area. Izzy likes to go with, a lot more things than just skill level. There's a lot of factors. They factor in area, if they're from the area, if they, how much they love the wings, that, that heart type thing that you can build through because it helps out with coming salary time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Getting that cap under the control. Having a guy that doesn't want to leave helps out for a mil maybe a million a year. So you take a Perfetti there and then there you go. You've got a choice between Drysdale and, Hol and Holtz, and I agree. That's a very difficult pick. I, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think I go Drysdale, but the more we talk, the more I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It it's is. Tough pick. It's, it's hard. Tough pick. You, you think about, you, I mean, we talked about Bob Murray, and, and I, I think the safe pick is probably Drysdale, and I mean, I, I bet that's what he would that's what he would make. He hasn't made a, a pick, a defenseman, picked a defenseman that high in, in a couple of years. So, uh, I mean, he hasn't picked a defenseman that high ever, but because <laughs> he hasn't yeah. had the, but I mean, he hasn't picked a, a first round defenseman and I can't, I can't think off the top of my head when the last time he did it, it had to have been 14, 15 or 16. Was it? Uh, On tour might be. Montour, yeah, maybe. Yeah, Chase, maybe. Chase Theodore before that, I think, was a first rounder. Um, they had a couple in a row after Cam Fowler, and then they kind of broke away from him. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, then they had, they over, that, I went, kind of wanted to get into that. But first of all, I did want to mention something we didn't even talk about before the show. One thing I got to say is I really love what he did by picking up uh, Danton Heinen and Sonny Milano. Uh, what a fantastic pickups those were when they made those like the Boston was so under using Danton Heinen and he showed so much uh, flair and skill, but they just couldn't get him up the lineup because of their, their depth. And uh, like kudos to him, to Murray, to being able to identify that and picking up for picking him up for so cheap. Um, and then 
he had the same thing with Sonny Milano. The only difference there is when Tortorella doesn't like a player, <laughs> it usually doesn't work out well for wherever he goes, except for what we're seeing in Ottawa with, uh, what's his name there? Um, it'll come to me, but uh, you know what I'm talking about. Their top scorer, this, their top scorer, this, goal scorer this year. For some reason, his name is leaving me, but uh, <laughs> the uh, Sonny Milano, I, I think, is going to be different, though. I think if you play Sonny Milano and just let him play and kind of let him be his goofball self in the room, and you know what I mean? Like, I think there's a, there's a little bit of just personality clash between uh, Tortorella and him at this young age, but I think in the long run, that'll work out all right. Yeah, uh, it was interesting hearing the reaction around the trade deadline from Ducks fans about the, excuse me, the trades that they made. Uh, they got, obviously, they got Heinen from the Bruins for, uh, I think they made two trades with the Bruins. They got they got Backus. I think the, the Heinen trade was, uh, was the second one? Now I'm like, <laughs> I got to look back. But the uh, they traded, they traded um, Kasha for, I believe, for, they traded Kasha and they traded um, that was a nice Richie trade. to the Bruins. Kasha yeah. for a first. Yeah. Was that the first this year? That and Lars first. Anderson. And uh, I think they took on Bacchus in that trade. The reason I'm confused is because they sent they sent Kasha and they sent Nick Richie to the Bruins, but I forgot exactly what combination of players belonged to which of the trades. But I, if you take them all together, I, lo- I mean, Ducks fans were upset about the prospect they got back from the Bruins, and they were comparing it to, uh, I forget the trade. Um, it was another trade an NHL team made. It was uh, Carolina and Toronto for Marlowe, uh, where uh, I think okay. Carolina, yeah. They, and they, were, they got Bacchus back. Yeah. yeah. The and, they were ups- yeah. and they were upset that uh, they had to get rid of Kasha, I think, to, to get to basically – get Bacchus's to get the first round pick basically along with Bacchus and, and Lars Anderson. And I think, I mean, I don't think necessarily that was a loss for either team. Uh, Richie is, serves a kind of a, a, a role that the Bruins needed a little more of. And Heinen has a chance now to play with, uh, get some more minutes, play with some better players. I mean, he, he, he was on the Bruins, so he's playing with good players in the first place, but I think that was a good trade for both teams. And I'm excited to see once we, get Ducks hockey back in the 2021 season, how he plays. Um, and, and similar with, uh, uh, with Richie on the Bruins and, and Kasha. Those are, there's just an interesting situation with a lot of guys. And then you're talking about Milano. Uh, Milano uh, is, <laughs> there's always that scratch ticket kind of player that Murray takes on. And a lot of teams like to take that on before it was Daniel Sprong and, and Sprung, kind of had similar problems in Anaheim that he did in uh, when he was with Pittsburgh that he was just uh he d- didn't quite get the defensive part of the game had a wicked shot but uh the the liability that that came about when he was on the ice was just not worth the the positive potential of of him shooting on net so i think Milano was a little more a little more like you're talking about pl- playing for Tortorella and and kind of be falling out of favor with him. But I, I think Milano, I think he, a lot of people are confident about him here. I think I'd like to see him get a good chance and, and I'd like to see Dallas Eakins kind of um, invest in him a little more. I think Milano is going to work out. All right. I think he's just a kid. that's taking a little longer to mature. And uh, I like his game. I like his, he's, he, I, he's got this, he's got it. He's got it. It's just a case of putting it together every day and putting this focus towards hockey every day. That's just a guess here. I'm not in the room. But looking at what I saw in the way he played and the ups and downs and stuff like that, you can tell that maybe he's just enjoying life a little more yeah, then for a little longer than some players do. You know? Yeah, I mean, he, he, got, he got in a little bit of legal trouble last off season, And, I mean, yeah. that's not... It, 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 you, you give a guy another chance, obviously, and, and hope that he can learn from it. But you, I mean, that, that does suggest that maybe he wasn't concentrating on his, his career quite so much at, at such a young age. So you, I think yeah. you're right. It depends on how you look at that, too. For the kid that maybe wasn't concentrating on his career so much, he was playing really good. You know what I mean? For a kid in the lineup, like mm-hmm. he did play for Columbus, yeah. you can see like this kid has got talent. It's just can he get that maturity? And I think he will. I, I really do mm-hmm. think he will. And as far as the Danton Heinen trade, I just thought it was an excellent identification of talent. 
Uh, and a lot of GMs are going to be left out in the cold, scratching their head, wondering why, why they didn't put a little more into their offer to get him. Because I think he's going to really blossom here, and Anaheim is going to do really well for you. It was much needed. The goat, he's got a shot. Like mm-hmm. he's got game. There's no doubt about it. Uh, his upside is a lot higher than a lot of people really realize because he was buried in that Boston lineup. I, I, I think when now that he's been set free a little bit, we could see uh, significant points from, from Danton Heinen. Um, uh, excellent moves. I just wanted to bring that up because I was really impressed with that. By the way, it was Anthony Duclair that I was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. He, it's good to see him playing well in Ottawa. I, I was a, I remember when he was drafted and I, I kind of took a while, took a while. Now that he's in Ottawa, he's, he's breaking out and it's always happy. You're always good to see that when, when there's a young player who's kind of struggling. So I'm happy for Duclair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And for Duclair, what I noticed uh, watching a lot of them, he's kind of fragile. He's kind of a fragile guy. He's a guy that kind of gets offended a little easier maybe than possibly people should and stuff like that. You got to kind of tiptoe with them. And uh, Tortorella and that personality may be a little bit difficult <laughs> combination. So, but, you know, what was amazing about Declare. Declare said that, because uh, they asked him about his time with Tortorella, and he said, I, l- I just, I don't want, I learned so much from him. And uh, I've learned, I learned so much from Tortorella. He never said a bad word about him. He just said, mm-hmm. I learned so much from him. I tried as best I could with him and all of those sort of things like that. So it's, that shows some a lot, you know, a, a, an increased maturity. And uh, um, we'll see what happens down in, down uh, as it goes. He kind of faltered in the end of the season last year. But uh, I think we could see something like that with Milano. I think I think it was a it was a fantastic uh, pickup for them. Um where was I going to go? I got to go back here to Anaheim because I had to go over to Ottawa to find out <laughs> what. Uh, oh, cap space. I was going to talk about that with cap. Uh, I look at their lineup and I see contracts that are pretty decent contracts. You mentioned that Murray is a hard kind of a hard ass when it comes to contracts. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, Jacob Silverberg at five million ain't nothing wrong with that. Uh, Adam Henrique is all the money at five eight, but I mean nothing. There's nothing really over an overpay here anywhere uh, that I can see. Yet. They're they're pretty close to the cap. Yeah, it's it all has to do with Corey Perry's buyout and his contract, and um, specifically, I mean Corey Perry. Or, yeah, ugh, Perry might be the Perry and Kessler, uh, although Kessler's contract is now LTIR eligible, so. Um, that's kind of a a silver lining, but Perry's contract was the one you probably point to where, uh, it it might've been the the term that he gave him, not, not necessarily the, the annual value, but, uh, the fact that he was going to be on, on the books for another, at least, I think it was a couple seasons. Uh, and now, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a long time. And, and, uh, he started to break down two years ago. So, that, that contract really, I mean, I think that's when you saw people starting to think, like, I don't think he's going to be around for much longer. But that buyout uh, hurts the Ducks on their cap. It went from two point, just a little over $2.6 million this season, and it goes up to $6.6 million next season. So yeah. that that's going to hurt. Um, and then you've got a couple of UFAs. You've got, uh, or, uh, you've got um, Delzato and Irwin. So, they, I mean, they're going to come off the books. I don't know if they're going to come back, but they're also not – burdensome in terms of their uh their current value so you're not going to get a lot of extra cap space there uh i think the one place where they can save a little bit is is their backup goalie situation ryan miller the rumors have been that ryan miller is going to retire um and at 1.125 i mean it was kind of a bargain for miller but if you can get a guy like boyle out of the ahl or stolarts uh i think you can shave a little bit off there from the from the 1.125 that uh that Miller's getting paid, but there isn't a lot of wiggle room, especially like we heard in the news of the cap past couple of days, that's going to be a flat cap for the next couple of seasons. So a mm-hmm. 1 million again, uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's a sticky situation that they're in. And, and that is without considering also that they, they have to um, get Sonny Milano re-signed because he's an RFA and Jacob Larson. So 
it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting. Luckily, they have their LTIR uh, for the next few seasons with uh, with Ryan Kessler for 2021 and, and 2021 22. So there is a little bit of wiggle room there, um, maybe to pick up. Uh, I wrote an article a past I think it was two or two or three ago where if they were gonna go after a free agent defenseman, maybe they could capitalize on the the uncertainty surrounding when the next season is going to start and, and kind of how the, how the salary cap is going to be flat over the next couple of seasons to get like a short term one year or two year deal, but at a higher average annual annual value that fits under that LTIR. Um, That would be, that would be probably the best case scenario for them, I think in the off season. So yeah, pretty tight to the salary cap. Well, fortunately for them, they're sort of on a rebuild as well. But um, again, for me, for my, for me, um, we're for Anaheim. I definitely wouldn't want a drawn out rebuild here because you have one of the finest goaltenders we have seen in decades. Like, uh, that's the other thing. John Gibson doesn't get, I don't hear enough about his name when it comes to the greatest goaltenders, great goaltenders in the league. Um, he, he's, he's up there. If he was on a team like the Rangers or something like that, he'd be winning business for sure. Uh, absolutely no doubt about it and uh this is a window i don't i wouldn't want to play around with would you agree no for sure uh and this season people would tell you that it was maybe a little bit more disappointing for him in terms of his performance but you can't forget that he's getting peppered uh and even going back to last season last season the ducks were allowing an unholy amount of shots just it was like relentless. I remember specifically a, a game against the Dallas Stars where he faced like something like 45, 50 shots. Uh, and it was just it was just a struggle. And I think that maybe warned him from carrying over from last season to this season. And, and there wasn't that much of an improvement in terms of they definitely limited shots a little more. Uh, I think Eric Branson helped a lot with that this year. But uh, it just <laughs> it's got to be exhausting to face that much rubber year in and year out. And so. Uh, for multiple reasons, you you want the team to be good because you want you want to have a good goaltender to to solidify a Stanley Cup run, but you also don't want to wear him out when he's young so that he that his career is shorter. I mean, with this with the decrease in size of goalie pads and and kind of the the NHL's move to try to make goal scoring easier, you hear a lot about how the. <laughs> You kind of wear those pucks a little a little more often and and end up a little more sore after games if you're a goaltender. So I mean, there's there's multiple reasons why you want to improve quickly and and take a best advantage of a, of a young, healthy John Gibson as you can. Yeah, um, he, fortunately he is only 26, so they do have a bit of a window. But I'd like to see them maximize that as much as possible because when the 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 benefit of having a John Gibson, and that's why people that say talk about Askarov, and you know, I don't think I don't think Anaheim needs to take an Askarov. Don't get me wrong, but I could see a team picking him higher because the benefits of having a goaltender of that magnitude, who could turn out to be like a Gibson like that, is that you don't need the elite forward or elite defense to win a cup. You just need a solid team. And uh, that's huge. Like, uh, and Gibson is. I, I think that if they could get a couple prospects and then start getting free agents in the next three three years, where Gibson's 28, 29 years old. Of course, he's going to have to get another contract by then, I believe. Is he? No, they got him signed. They up signed him. Yeah. Six four. Uh, but the the Ducks luckily uh, have another young goaltender who's starting to come of age. Uh, he hasn't played at all in the NHL, but his name is Lucas Dostal. He's a Czech goaltender. He's been playing very well. Uh, I'm looking at his stats for the World Juniors in 2018-19 for the Czechs. He, he goals against in the tournament of 1.25 uh, and a save percentage of 9.57. And, and those aren't, those aren't uh, kind of uh, outliers. Those are He's been very consistently good at the lower levels, uh, at the younger levels, at junior and uh, played in Liga last year, uh, 43 starts, 1.78 goals against, 9, 0.928 save percentage. So he's a young guy that's going to, uh, that's going to, I mean, maybe not push Gibson, but he, he's some depth that that uh, a good backup plan if you need it. Hopefully, he he has that same success uh, in the NHL once he does make it here. But uh, he he's a he's kind of a sneaky good guy that the Ducks have in the in the system. 
picked up in the third round in 2018, I see. Dostal. Oh, yeah. He struggled a little bit in this World Juniors, but uh, this year, but he he's his track record is a good one. So did Askarov as well, uh, but that doesn't really say much of everything. You know, it, uh, you got a different team in front of you. It's all part of the learning process. But yeah, his numbers do look pretty fantastic. So yeah, that's good to have as well. Um, but with that being the case, you, you've, you're always in there when you got a guy like Gibson, and certainly you don't want to drain his like you were just talking about a goaltender keeps on taking rubber like that over and over and over and over again. It gets, it wears on you. It wears mm-hmm. on anyone really, even a guy that fantastic. And I saw the frustration in him last year. I watched a lot of Anaheim games because most of the games I watch are when the wife's gone to bed and stuff and it's the late <laughs> game. So I, and I like watching Anaheim. I, I like to see teams rebuilding and, and teams that I enjoy uh, making smart moves and, seeing the improvement in them. And Anaheim has been one of those teams that I've really been, been enamored with. Uh, but I really did think their, their overall prospect pool was a little better. And then I realized that it's not that it's bad. It's just that it's safe. It's a very safe prospect pool. As, uh, and uh, that, that can come back to bite you a little bit in the long run. But I do understand it. We're in a, you're in a market where uh, missing those draft picks are, it's just not, it can kill you can absolutely mm-hmm. kill you because uh you you can't this is anaheims and stuff like that going through rebuilds for an ownership is just not something you can want to do that's for sure uh, you want to keep that fan base uh in- interested all the time i would say yeah i think that's what's going to make this draft particularly interesting uh not only because of of covid19 and everything that's going on but uh, if the Ducks miss the playoffs next season, which there's a strong chance that they will, that'll be the tied for the longest consecutive playoffs uh, drought they've had. They've twice gone three seasons without making it when they first came into the league. And then I believe maybe like a, about a decade when they, I think around the 2000s, right before they started to make those 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 runs and uh, they made that run against New Jersey and, and lost in the finals. But preceding that, they, they struggled a little bit. So... Uh, even though the Ducks are an expansion franchise and they kind of fly under the radar, they'd never really gone that long missing the playoffs. So um, that's just a long way of saying, I wonder if Bob Murray's seat is very slowly heating up. The, uh, the Samuelis have obviously put a lot of trust and faith in him and, and he's done a great job, but like nobody is infallible. And, and I wonder if he, if that caused him to take more risks or fewer risks, it's just going to be an interesting situation. That's a good point. And there's a guy out there who's pretty darn good at the draft. Keeping His name is Hextall. You might know him. Uh, yeah. He did a fantastic job with Philadelphia. It's so unfortunate that the owner wanted to be a little, in, wanted to be impatient. There's, and that's fine. You know, it's cool. I think it's going to work out for Philadelphia as well. But if uh, if an ownership wants to see a team, a guy re- build a team that never dies, I think Hextall would be a great pick there. Nothing. Sorry, Mr. Murray. I'm not <laughs> wanting to lose your job. But if that sort of thing were to happen, uh, <laughs> I know you're listening too, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, one other thing I'd like to talk to you before we head out, and uh, I we had him in uh, Edmonton for a little bit, but Dallas Eakins, and uh, what do you what what's your what do you what do you what's your feel about uh, how that is all working out with him there? It's it's funny. It's really, um, I mean, obviously the Edmonton fans know about kind of what happened there, and that that he he really didn't get much of a chance, but he also kind of let let the team get away from him. He he kind of there was a little bit of an insurrection. You remember with the whole this the what was his name for his defensive system the swarm, uh, and that and that kind of it, as a young coach he kind of faltered there. And and before last season started, I kind of compared him to Bruce Cassidy, uh, where I said that that would be the Ducks' best case scenario, where you talk about Bruce Cassidy coaching the Bruins now, but when he was in Washington, he got run out of town. I mean, he was not popular with the players and rightfully so some of the stories that were told about him. Uh, and he spent what more than a decade in the coaching in the minors and, uh, to the point where now he's, he's to, to Stanley cup finals. And, and I, I hope that that happens for Dallas Eakins. Uh, it was interesting. An article came out a couple, couple weeks ago, um, 
where they asked Murray about how Eakins did. And, and Murray kind of gave, a, 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 through text, it was hard to interpret exactly what his feelings were. He certainly uh, praised Eakins for some of the stuff he did, but he also kind of took responsibility to be like, well, I, I kind of didn't really put the screws to him. I didn't really make him... Uh, I didn't really kind of put the pressure on him to to do certain things, to, to be harder on the younger players. And it sounded like Murray was a little bit unhappy with a loss of direction that happened in the middle of the season, that the, the young players were... Uh, I mean, it's a good thing in a way that Dallas Eakins is putting a lot of faith in them and putting them in situations. But I think it sounded to me, without him saying those exact words, that uh, maybe those younger players needed a little bit more easing into into regular NHL time and situations. And I mean, the, the example I pointed out um, over the over the winter was Sam Steele spent a lot of time uh, on three and three overtime. And there was one. I know three on three overtime is a totally different animal. It's not five on five. It's not four on four. But there were a couple of occasions where Sam Steele made some pretty egregious errors that resulted in in a, a game winning goal for the opposing team. Um, and I, I asked um, my podcast partner at the time uh, um, what what he felt about it. And he's like, well, you can't really be worried about that. And you got to give him some experience. And I just thought, well, he got kind of bowled over and one, I forget who they were playing, but he just got walked right around, uh, and, and, uh, for a goal against that obviously was a game winner cause it was an overtime. So I think that might be more what Murray was concerned about. Like, yeah, the ducks need to give their young players some experience, but I think he, he might've thought that Eakins was giving them too much of a, too long of a leash. Um, so uh, I forget what his quote was at the end of the at the end of that article, but it was something along the lines of we'll make sure that he I, I'm not going to give him as much of uh, a leash on my own part to, uh, to make as many mistakes as he did last year. So it was kind of a, a kind of an interesting I don't know if it was a backhanded compliment or a uh, or a qualified vote of confidence, but it was interesting to read. Um, so uh, overall, I think Dallas Eakins has done a a relatively good job. Like we mentioned when we were talking yesterday, the the ducks are always competitive. There were very few games where they were blown out. Uh, mm. And the ones they were, they were usually dealing with some pretty serious injuries on the defensive side. Uh, but the ducks were always in games under Eakins. And that's an important, uh, an important factor, I think for a team that doesn't have that many offensive weapons in the first place. So uh, I think he's done a good job. It would be nice to see him take another step forward and improve, but I think he, I think he can, he can still be a, a winning coach and, and coach here for a while, uh, provided that he, he makes the correct adjustments. Yeah. When he was in Edmonton, I mean, it's funny you say that because it's uh, he's, I, he's kind of a hard ass really, especially when it comes to conditioning. Uh, if he was, he's major into conditioning and he expects his players to be at top condition and pushes them a lot in that area. Um, however, as far as playing young players, hard to say, cause it's all we had. So, mm-hmm. uh, it would be very difficult for me to say that he played the veteran over because we had too many, way too many young players at the time for me to make that a session, uh, make that, uh, it's all, I think he was just trying to gain trust with his players. He probably, if it was just throwing things out the wall here, if if these guys were well conditioned and they were constantly working out and showing that they were um, keeping that up um, top fitness, which seems to be his highest, uh, uh, his number one uh, attribute that he looks for, he probably was going to give them a lot of rope. And maybe yeah. that was what was going on. And uh, the manager is sort of saying, well, you know, we got to win and, uh, as well. And if a guy's not playing, you know, and that can, can, can ruin the confidence of a player too. You can only go back to the guy and say, okay, it's okay. So many times before it actually starts to hurt the actual player. And maybe that's what Murray's talking about. There is maybe he was going so much in that direction that it was actually hurting the players that he was trying to show confidence in, um, or something like that. But it's interesting. Dallas Eakins has been, uh, somebody that has been well, appreciated everywhere he's gone as far as a coach is concerned and uh in edmonton i think he was a little bit in over his head i didn't think it was a wise move to take somebody that young uh even though he shows to be somebody who's probably going to be one of the great coaches uh but uh it'll be interesting to see how he goes for moving forward in uh 
in Anaheim there. But my friend, this has been fantastic. And uh, I'm so, I've, I've been so happy to have you. Everybody out there, show this guy some love. Uh, you, and, uh, go over to his Twitter there at uh, D E L L I tweets and uh, read up on his stuff if you really want to appreciate. He's, he's a fine writer. Um, out of, uh, I, I identified with like guys like Jamie Basco, who I, and David Staples and some of the other guys I work with. This guy's every bit of those guys, I'm telling you right now. So go over there and check them out. Uh, and uh, we're going to hopefully come back on again, I hope. Oh, for uh, sure. Yeah, I had a great time. This is fun. I, I, and, and, and subscribe. Watch and subscribe Perlo's, uh, Perlo's YouTube show. This is great. This is a, uh, I really enjoyed it, and, and uh, I'm going to go back and, and catch up on all the ones I've missed. <laughs> all right. For all of you guys out there, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm sure you have. Why wouldn't you? Have a great day and lots of love to you.